College. Uh, he's a professor of medicine in the uh, infectious disease uh, division of uh, the Department of Medicine. He received his uh, MD degree down the uh, I-94 at uh, uh, Northwestern, and he completed residency there. And then he uh, <coughs> spent uh, time in London getting a Master of Science degree at the uh, uh, School of uh, Tropical uh, Medicine and Hygiene. Uh, and uh, I was saying to him that I'm jealous of uh, not having chosen infectious diseases as a specialty, tro particularly tropical medicine, because he's been in a lot of different places that uh, it would be uh, fun to go to, although he claims he's been working and it's mostly his students who've been at the beach. Um, he um, did his um, research fellowship um, at uh, Case Western Reserve, and I, I'm not sure if that's how he got to the medical college because our former chairman, uh, Dick Olds, was uh, uh, also a um, infectious disease expert and uh, also in uh, tropical medicine. I always wondered how people from the Midwest got to be experts in tropical medicine, but he'll, perhaps he'll tell us uh, about that. Uh, for most of his career, he, uh, many years, he was a uh, uh, professor at uh, Michigan State uh, University and worked his way up uh, through the uh, ranks there. And as I say, he was recruited to the medical college in uh, 2005, and he's been here ever since. Uh, his uh, research work has been pro primarily in the area of parasitology, but um, his um, uh, wide experience throughout the world has uh, uh, led to his uh, appointment as a Jefferson Science Fellow and Senior Science Advisor at the State Department of State, which he told me he has to, he got a, had to be awarded a top secret clearance in order to go to the bathroom by himself. <laughs> so, uh, 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 Mike has, grill, uh, has uh, uh, graciously agreed to give us a talk about the latest uh, and uh, probably not the last uh, um, uh, worldwide uh, medical problems of emerging diseases that have traveled far and wide. It's going to talk about emerging infections. Elizabeth Kingia to Zika. Right. And don't kill yourself. Well, thank you very much, Jack. Thank you, everybody, for inviting me here. This is. Uh, this is a real treat for me. It's the first time I've been here. Um, although I was telling some people my, my middle daughter decided to get married next year, so she's getting to scout out venues <laughs> for weddings. So I'm gonna have to tell her about uh, she'll scout this place. But she already informed me that my major role, other than helping pay for things, just stay out of the way. <laughs> so any day I get to talk about infectious diseases is a great day. My sort of passion. Um, so rather than talk about all emerging infectious diseases, A to Z, we'll just stick with the E to Z. Um, two things have been quite in the news. So just on my way here, I think I heard that Congress uh, uh, did put up over a billion dollars for more Zika prevention kinds of things. But um, for, for the purpose of CME, um, talking with Amy, I decided to put down three kind of specific objectives. <clears throat> and rather than just talk about two, these two emerging diseases uh, by themselves, I thought I would try to explain how I think about emerging diseases and vector-borne diseases in general. So I chose as my first objective just to talk a little bit about and, and remember the amazing work that's done by microbial ecologists around the world. I had many friends at Michigan State in the Center for Microbial Ecology, environmental microbiologists, who really do an amazing amount of work that we sometimes forget about in the, in the medical community because it's often not directly related to human medical microbiology, but amazing and important work, especially when it comes 
to understanding how new diseases seem to pop up from time to time. <clears throat> Secondly, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what some people will refer to as hidden vectors or hidden ecosystems out there that are there, but we just don't realize they're there uh, because they don't no normally intersect with our lifestyles or the little ecosystems that we deal with because our levels of hygiene and other things uh, put us in a, in, a, in a nice position, but uh, very important, especially for mosquito-borne diseases, I think, to, to realize what's going on. And since I'm a big Jeopardy fan, I thought I'd try to wrap this up with my final Jeopardy question and answer. If I'm successful talking about the first two things, uh, hopefully um, you'll understand better what these two emerging diseases actually have in common. Elizabeth Kingia, which is uh, causing problems here in Wisconsin, and the Zika virus, which is causing problems in the United States, but really all over the world. So, let's get started. <clears throat> so first things first, the words emerging infectious disease actually mean slightly different things to different people. So if you look up a formal definition, technically it means the incidence of this disease has increased over the last 20 years. However, if you look up definition of incidence, the rate of occurrence is perhaps one more common definition, but some people also like to include the, the influence, uh, the rate of influence or the emerging influence sometimes. Uh, so included in that definition would be things that could increase if the conditions are right. Perhaps uh, emerging infectious disease would come on the, uh, on the scene because it's, there's a newly identified species or some strain of something that's just seemed like it came out of nowhere uh, that may have evolved anew for some reason. Or maybe there are infectious agents that have just spread to a new population because well, either the insects or the vectors or the people from different parts of the world have migrated. There's lots of examples of that. Sometimes an infection is considered a re-emerging because it has new clinical features. So um, years ago, for example, we, uh, before HIV came on the scene, we, all, we thought uh, that they, human herpes virus 8 never did anything. But in the era of HIV, human herpes virus 8 was found to be associated with Kaposi sarcoma. But then, in populations of the world where there was no HIV, you see people living generation after generation after generation with no capacities, and the whole population has herpes virus 8. So the influence of new co-infections is, is often uh, one way that new diseases or manifestations of old diseases seem to come on the market. Sometimes there are synergistic interactions. Of, uh, convergence of, of things that come together to lead to develop novel features such as this the two infectious disease sometimes animal reservoirs um, introduce things into human populations where it does, wasn't there before but I had a, one of my professors uh, early on was considered himself a medical geographer and when talking about the epidemiology of diseases around the world he would always say it always boils down population environment relationships and that's the way the broad category of uh, in which I think about <clears throat> um, emerging diseases so um, first CME objective was uh, was a little bit about microbial ecology there's actually a journal of microbial ecology I chose this picture here a uh, pretty picture of the hot springs so the what's the definition of microbial ecology it's the study of microbes in our environment in their interactions. What kind of interactions? Well, interactions with each other, interactions higher lower species, prokaryotes, eukaryotes, bacteria, fungi, etc. Microbes and the chemicals in our environment. It was a great when I first started in Michigan State that microbial ecologists were analyzing the situation where these like, um, environmental gram negatives in the upper peninsula of um, uh, of, 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 um, of Michigan were dissolving the asphalt, asphalt on some newly paved roads up there, you know, trying to sort those mysterious things out. There are a lot of interesting environmental adaptations that bacteria can do. 
Other interaction, microbe human, microbe animal, microbe microbe interactions. So <clears throat> we were talking a little bit about how, uh, how uh, molecular technologies and things have come on the scene and the letters PCR, for example, everybody talks about those on rounds now. Oh yes, we're gonna amplify that DNA, blah, blah, blah. What is PCR? The whole magic of PCR is the one you're able to amplify a little bit of DNA one of the ingredients you put into your little mixture is a, is a thermostable DNA polymerase, a de an enzyme that is not uh, denatured when you heat it up to almost 100 degrees. And that was sort of a magical ingredient that made all PCR possible. It was thank you to the microbial ecologists of the world who discovered studying hot springs like the Elvestone that the bacteria that lived in there were not denatured, the way your enzymes and my enzymes, they thrive at high temperatures. So the first enzyme used in PCR, which is used for everything nowadays, is called, was called TAC polymerase. And that stood for, that was abbreviation for Thermus aquaticus. The bacteria that was found living in the hot springs. So there's a lot of, many examples of how microbial ecologist and just knowing what's out there. You don't know what's out there in, unless you really look sometimes. So, um, so microbial ecology. <clears throat> Number two, I just wanted to talk a little about these so-called hidden ecosystems out there. Um, they're really important for understanding the emergence or the appearance of emergence of new diseases. So the two examples I wanted to use is, first of all, my favorite example when I talk to medical students about tropical diseases and parasitology, uh, this, uh, Lake Douglas, Michigan, and then second, we'll talk a good deal about mosquitoes. So I don't know if any of you ever had the opportunity to meet Harvey Blankenspore. He was at University of Michigan for many, many years, and then he became chair of biology at Hope College in Holland. Back in the first George Bush administration, he was named Teacher of the Year. That's a picture with the president and put on a tuxedo. And one of the amazing things he did was develop this very unique course where he would get all the medical students and people interested in parasites, get them all up to northern Michigan, to Lake Douglas, where the University of Michigan had a uh, field station, beautiful lake. So what's he dragging students up there to learn about tropical diseases? Now we don't have the malaria and the sleeping sickness and all these things. In the United States, they're not endemic, right? They're not now, at least. He had a really unique course. He invited them up there to study all these different kinds of diseases, but the manifestations in animals. So he could point to the frogs, the raccoons, the snakes, the animals all living in and around Lake Douglas and give you an example of anything. You want to study sleeping sickness, trypanosomes in the blood and all this stuff. Well, you wouldn't go find a human. He would tell you exactly which species of frog naturally had trypanosomes in their blood. In blood sample, you would see exactly, they look morphologically almost identical to the human parasites. Same thing for malaria, plasmodium species. Um, Certain ones affect uh, certain uh, birds, lots of avian, and so on and so forth. Snakes have tapeworms that look just like human tapeworms. Raccoons have roundworms that look like just like human uh, roundworms. If you want to study filaria, we all finished eating, so I won't tell you, I'll tell you what you find in old dairy cows. But um, closer to home, uh, some of you may have heard a couple years ago, there's this very beloved orangutan at the Milwaukee Zoo. I don't know who passed away under mysterious circumstances. I don't know if anybody remembers seeing that. The results of that mysterious investigation was actually published in the CDC's Journal of Emerging Infectious Diseases. Because what they found was he died of an unknown <laughs> disseminated parasitic disease. <coughs> Where in the world did that come from in Milwaukee? So did he get this from Borneo, where he was born, it just you know came out, or I think he was loaned to Colorado, or, you know, it was a mysterious thing. No one ever looked in the environment in Milwaukee before. However, with the help of the health department, with the help of the, the vets at uh, Wisconsin Madison, guess what? They found <coughs> this parasite 
is endemic in the little animals in and around the grounds of Milwaukee Zoo. Mm. No one ever looked before it, they had a, never reason to look, but it's there. So another example of these sort of hidden little e ecosystems that are out there that we don't often think about and sort of until we have to, but knowing what's out there is really, really important. That's the point I wanted to say about that. Medical entomology, I've hung with a lot of entomologists and animal health diagnostic people in Michigan State, so they have a lot of fun questions and, and quiz questions in their journals. So, have any U.S. presidents ever had malaria? Anybody? Sure. Well, actually, all these people have had malaria. <laughs> and this, this one's getting Lincoln just right in the, this, I took this right out of the medical entomology journal. So all these, all these presidents had malaria. Um, George Washington, where did he get malaria at age 17? In Virginia. Uh, Abraham Lincoln got it in Illinois. Andrew Jackson was somewhere in Florida. Uh, Ulysses Grant got it his in St. Louis. Uh, Garfield got it in Ohio. At least uh, Teddy Roosevelt was wandering around the Amazon, so he had a good excuse. And John F. Kennedy was in the South Pacific, uh, World War II. But everybody else got malaria in the United States. So this is a great, I love looking at great old maps. So this is a map of the United States from about the early 1800s. And the red areas indicate uh, the proportion of deaths due to malaria relative to all other causes of death. Holy smokes, we had malaria killing people all the way up into Wisconsin. But we don't have malaria anymore. Why is that? It's not because we got rid of the mosquitoes, though. Malaria was interrupted for two major reasons. The species that cause human disease are human-specific. They don't infect animals. It can make a little reservoir of disease to reinfect people. And secondly, we had enough medicines, quinine in, in the first place, that could knock down the number of parasites in our blood such that even when a mosquito bit you again, they couldn't reinfect somebody else. So we did not do anything to the mosquito populations, and this is really, uh, and we were still able to get rid of malaria. The mosquitoes are still here, and this is a lesson that, uh, yeah, Anopheles mosquitoes are the ones that transmit malaria, but the same kind of mosquitoes are all over the place that can transmit Zika and things. Work of uh, entomologists has never done. I put this busy slide up there just to let you know that the entomologists of the world are constantly analyzing where certain kinds of mosquitoes live. This is, this is just the uh, malaria vector map of the world. And look at the United States there. You've got every place east with uh, mosquitoes that are capable of transmitting malaria. It's just that we don't have people infecting the mosquitoes, and then infecting more people. Um, so, busy slide, but it's, it's very complicated work, and I have the highest regard for the microbial ecologists, the environmental science who are keeping track of all this stuff, because this is what you fall back on a lot when, it, when you have new problems and issues. <clears throat> Different kind of mosquito, this is a CDC a map that uh, they put out this year. Uh, other map was eight uh, Anopheles mosquitoes, which transmit malaria, uh, but it's the 80s mosquitoes that are transmitting Zika. Different genus, different kind of mosquitoes. On the left there is a, um, on the left is the, uh, the distribution CDC uh, estimated that the blue areas are all areas where there are 80s Egypti mosquitoes, sort of normal. You can, if you know where to look, you can go into downtown Washington, D.C. and find 80s Egypti. 80s Egypti first claim to fame was the transmitting yellow fever. Um, but uh, an 80s Egypti are more likely, are a better uh, mosquito than some others to transmit Zika. But yellow fever is the same family of viruses as Zika, called flaviviruses. On the east is a, 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 or on the right is this other map of a different 80s mosquito called 80s elbopictus, 
which actually didn't make it into the United States at all until the 1980s. Some of you may remember that there was a lot of talk about this Asian tiger mosquito that somehow got imported into the United States. And looky there, that has gone like wildfire in the last 30 years. And here we go. We're all the way up northern into, into Minnesota, creeping up the border of Wisconsin. And it's covered the entire state of Illinois and moved its way up all the way to Maine. So these are all um, mosquitoes that could transmit flaviviruses such as yellow fever, Zika. Just the Aedes aegypti is a little bit better. So as long as the vector is present and it sort of falls below our radar screen, we don't have yellow fever or malaria, we sort of forget about these mosquitoes. Mosquitoes just become sort of pests that uh, aggravate our backyard barbecues or something. But as long as the vectors are present, any introduction of new microorganism or virus is a reason for a potential new, either local or wider spread um, disease uh, dissemination. So a little bit more about Zika, is, uh, I mentioned, is a member of this family of viruses called flaviviruses. There's actually a couple of genus of different gen genera of, of viruses. There's a genus also called flavivirus. The flavus comes from uh, yellow in Latin, and the yellow fever is sort of maybe the flagship disease of flaviviruses. But many of the flaviviruses cause neurological disease, like Zika's doing. So uh, not all of them, but some. So we have dengue is a, is a, is a flavivirus. A lot of people forget actually hepatitis C is in the family Flaviviridae. It's not the same genus as Zika, but it's a very close cousin. But Japanese encephalitis has been around for a long time. We have a, uh, a fairly, uh, we have a vaccine against that, but St. Louis encephalitis, West Nile, which came on the scene, you know, not that long ago. These are all other examples of neurological, uh, or, or viruses that can cause neurological problems, such as Zika's doing. So, but at least, if you remember that map with the 80s, the Egypti, at least here in Wisconsin, they haven't, the mosquitoes haven't invaded us yet, right? So I believe that CDC map, so at least we don't. So that means we don't have any human flavivirus diseases here in Wisconsin. Is that right? Uh, it seemed to follow. We heard a no. People travel. People travel, sure. There's always the important thing, but I don't know if we have anybody from the health department here, but I borrowed one of their maps and their circulars. So some of you may have, it's not a common disease, but it's common enough in Wisconsin that the health department has a formal circular and stuff. There's this disease where Wisconsin is actually number three on the hit parade, along with these states, for a virus, a neuroinvasive virus called Powassan. Powassan is actually a town in Ontario someplace. Most of these diseases get named for the city where they first occurred. But um, that, this neuroinvasive flavivirus is in all these places, in, uh, uh, not common, but it's all there. So this is a, a, from the circular for the health department. is a rare, fortunately, not to, to, to transmitted by mosquitoes. Big question. This is a tick-borne flavivirus. And unfortunately, it's the Ixodes scapularis ticks, the same one that transmits Lyme disease and babesiosis and anaplasmosis, can also transmit POAS. So um, other ticks, unfortunately, can also transmit it. But, but it's an example of flaviviruses spreading out, so not just mosquito-borne. Um, and Wisconsin, unfortunately, is famous for its rare cases of POAS and virus. But at least, I say, at least there aren't that many flaviviruses to worry about, right? You know, we, we, we saw those five or six, right, that mentioned the neuro. So there, there couldn't be any more out there, right? Well, the uh, microbial ecologists and the entomologists have proved everybody wrong. So this, this slide, the rest of this slide, I've intentionally made the font small so you couldn't read it, just to give you the impression how many there are. So there's a bunch. All the ones on the top are all tick-borne flaviviruses. Down here, this, this is starting the list of mosquito-borne flaviviruses. There's the rest of them. 
not just mosquitoes and mammals and, uh, and uh, vertebrates. The ones on the right over here, these are all bat flaviviruses. Some of my favorites are here. There's, here's a flaviviruse that was found in a, para a worm parasitizing soybean crops. It has its own flavivirus. And then you've got a whole bunch of, uh, at least four of them that have been discovered. The only reason they know these exist is because when they ground up mosquitoes to study their DNA, they said, uh oh, that's not just mosquito DNA, there's virus DNA. So, they're, so they only identify these by sequencing the genome of certain mosquitoes. So lots of flaviviruses out there, lots of them with weird names, many named for the city or the town where they were discovered, like Zika was from the Zika forest in Uganda. Um, names that don't mean much to us, they mean a lot more to the people who live in those areas. But unfortunately, lots of flaviviruses uh, that we really don't know the full extent to which they can do things to humans or other animals. So in this sense, I say for many years, Zika was sort of a flavivirus in search of a disease to, to associate with itself. So in 1947 was when it was found in Uganda. A few years later, the people who knew what a Zika virus was actually found it in a, in a human uh, shortly thereafter. But then over the next... Uh, 50 years, it sort of spread out over the world throughout the South Pacific and Southeast Asia, and then at some point jumped into Brazil. The cases with the little yellow circles are the imported cases, but uh, remembering that map that the CDC produced of the 80s Egypti and the Albopictus, you know, we've got tons of 80s mosquitoes all over the United States. Uh, uh, when I when I made this slide, it was 27. We work with 30 in these countries now. So, because the vectors are there, there's always the potential that if you in, in, introduce an infected human or infected animals, that the disease may be. This is why diseases can go off and running because the vectors are sort of hidden in plain sight, you might say. So one one of the big things that was talked about with Zika is. Uh, even even after all these cases of microcephaly were reported in Brazil, there's there some hesitancy on the part of the CDC and other scientists to say, yes, this is Zika is actually causing that. And then just in April 13th, this paper came out in uh, New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, it was called Reviewing the Evidence for Causality for Zika. And uh, it, when, if you read that article, they talk about applying the Shepherd criteria for teratogenicity. So Shepard was a, was a famous scientist who studied all sorts of things that cause congenital diseases. And he came up with six criteria, that if you met those criteria, then you could say with some certainty that that was actual cause of the, of the birth defects. So uh, proven exposure to the agent in the case of Zika, was that not? Well, yes, these people are living in Zika endemic areas. Consistent findings, they said partially, because some people, 80% well, of the people with Zika had no symptoms, but if you, if you were a pregnant woman, you couldn't have a baby with a birth defect, microcephaly, the reports about maybe Guillain-Barre associated things. So they, that's why they said partially. Careful delineation of clinical cases, defects and syndromes. There was a lot of clinical data being accumulated that said this looks bad. Environmental exposure to the agents, the mosquitoes were all over the place, everybody had exposure. Proof in an animal model, that was the main one that was lacking for Zika, at least at this time. So to, to Shepard criteria, causality was pretty confident if you had a 1 plus 2 plus 3 criteria, or a 1 and 2 and 4. So I did not use the animal model it's hard to find animal models. Not every animal is susceptible to the same kind of organisms that affect people. But, um, but uh, so this was the, the New England Journal article that, that sort of clinched it, describing how the Shepherd's criteria uh, were met for Zika. People have been working on animal models even harder now that, uh, to try to clinch that one Shepherd criteria. 
So this is a paper that was just, this one just came out uh, May 5th, just uh, a week or so ago. A susceptible mouse model for Zika virus. So now the floodgates are open. You can be able to study exactly uh, in the development of a, of a, of a baby mouse uh, at what point and how does the virus interact to cause these defects. Um, the only problem with this, now there are other people, uh, I've heard people at Hopkins and other places are developing other mouse. This was sort of the, one of the first ones that came out. And it wasn't a completely normal mouse, so they had to have an immune deficient mouse model, an interferon receptor deficient mouse, but at least they got a mouse and could prove that in this model, Zika was causing congenital diseases. <coughs> This is also a little busy, busy slide. I just, I just wanted to show this because I say this is the classic kind of thing that the CDC sends out, and I'm not sure if our health department has, probably has a similar thing. It's a testing algorithm for Zika. So I look at this and I say, it's important to look what's there, what's not there. So um, I say, there's something missing from this algorithm. Um, and this was particularly important. I had, uh, uh, a patient came to me about six months ago, and he lives here in Wisconsin with his wife. They went to Brazil to visit some of his relatives when his wife was five or six months pregnant, had a wonderful time, nobody was sick, came back, the baby was born with microcephalic. So this was before all the, the Zika alarms were raised, so he came and said, you know, we've thought about it long, hard, we really would like to know if uh, Zika was the cause of our baby's problem. So uh, the health department talked to the CDC. And what do you think I, they said to me, the CDC, when I said I have a patient? This was two years later. But the baby was already a year and a half old. So his exposure was like two years before. So he said to the CDC, can you do uh, like an IgG, the convalescent Zero epidemiology. And May 3rd, where you're up to probably 64 patients. A lot of uh, people died. Um, not everybody died. Um, but uh, where in the world did this come from? Why didn't we ever hear about Elizabeth Aquino before this? So, thinking back on some of the things I said about environmental microbiology and all the scientists out there checking this and checking that. This is a perfect example of an environmental bacteria sort of crossing over into our world, into the human ecosystem. So before I, I have just only like one more slide about uh, Elizabeth King, I am sort of wrapping up. So one more quiz question. This is probably worth at least 600 points on Jeopardy. So this food is frequently enjoyed uh, by baby larval mosquitoes. When you see them in your backyard in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the forest, sometimes see them in those puddles of water and they're wiggling around a little bit and they have to eat something when they're in that, those puddles of water. So uh, why do I ask that question? Well, the answer to that question really explains what Elizabeth Kenya as a bacteria has in common with Zika. This is my CV objective number three. So in order to get this, you have to understand a little bit about the secret life of mosquitoes. So mosquito eggs are here, they, they're aquatic insects. When they hatch, these little larvae come out, look a little brine shrimp kind of things. They have this interesting little device on their rear ends which, through which they breathe, a snorkel. So that's why in water they eventually hang upside down, put the snorkel out of the water so they can breathe. But their heads are down here constantly eating, 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 growing. Well, what do larval mosquitoes eat? Well, they eat what's in the water standing around and it's from the soil and the environment. Larvae spend most of their time eating whatever's there, algae, sometimes other microbes, sometimes other larvae. They eat a lot of environmental bacteria. That's why some entomologists, when they're trying to think of new control measures for mosquitoes, they say, well, maybe we'll try to introduce a new kind of bacteria with some toxin in the environment, and then mosquitoes eat it and they'll die. Well, and then we were talking a little bit about genetically modified food, and the whole genetically modified everything is very controversial, but um, mosquitoes eat a lot of bacteria when they're growing up. 
and they retain some of those bacteria as they get older. So number one thing to remember about this, even though that's a big, long, I don't know how many syllables in Elizabeth Kenya, it's not the genus and the species, it's just the genus. So as of right now, there are four different species of Elizabeth Kenya, and they're all aerobic, gram-negative, environmental bacteria, they find them in soils and rivers, and if you know how to look for them, and distinguish all the various gram-negative bacteria. Uh, it was Dr. Elizabeth King, who was the microbiologist at the CDC, uh, who was uh, named in her honor. But four species. So quintessential environmental bacteria. This one has nothing to, to do. So it's Elizabeth Kingia endophytica. Where do they find that one? Well, they cultured some sick sweet corn plants. It had nothing to do with people. But that's uh, species number one of, of Elizabeth Kingia. Species number two, Elizabeth Kingia meningosteptica. Well, that is a known cause. I don't know, as a pediatrician, if you ever saw those, but they had one in children's just a couple weeks ago. That particular species is not the one that's causing the outbreak in Wisconsin. This next one's my favorite. Here's Dr. So thank you again, microbial ecologists. And these are the ones that work for NASA and astronauts. So this next one is called Elizabeth Kingia miricola. Where do they find this? This is isolated from condensed water found on the Russian Mir space station. So how in the world <laughs> did it get out there? What are we sending in outer space? So miricola is from the Mir space station. Uh, last but not least, we have species number four, Elizabeth Kingiana, Kingia anophilus. Sound like anophilus? Well, it should be because it's originally isolated from anopheles mosquito. That's what Dr. King and others were studying: the ecology of organisms found in vectors of human diseases, and that's where it came from. And that's the one that especially in immunocompromised people, is causing pneumonia, septic shock, and deaths. And that is what's causing uh, the outbreak. Uh, and CDC is still roaming about, I think. I know we saw them at Freighter a few times. They're culturing everything in the environment. I haven't seen any definite conclusions yet of their findings. They always keep these, as you can imagine, you know, these are complicated medical legal kind of things that they have to we call a product or something a liability. So they keep all their data sort of close to their chest until they're ready to make an announcement. So I don't know what they're gonna say. But they have made, you may have seen one of these slightly cryptic statements they did come out with. And now that I've talked about mosquitoes and where Elizabeth King is, it, it's sort of more understandable, hopefully. So the CDC says that the possibility of a role for mosquitoes in the maintenance and transmission of, of Elizabeth Kingia Anopheles remains unclear. <laughs> so they, they don't know what, what, why it has affected so many people in Wisconsin, but it's the Anopheles species. So knowing where it started out, you know, if it were an epidemic uh, of the Miracola, we'd have to blame the Russians or whoever, whoever loaded up the water into the space station. But, but that is so. That's the answer to the final Jeopardy question. That's what Zika, as in virus, has in common with Elizabeth Kingia bacteria, and they're both originally found in mosquitoes. So to summarize, I, I talk about emerging infectious diseases are always here. There's always going to be something because our planet is not sterile. And there's an amazing amount of microbial diversity out there. And um, so that basic research done by the ecologists and the entomology who keep track of all this stuff can really help us make sense. And that's why sometimes interdisciplinary research is so important to sort these things out. So when the, the poor orangutan passed away at the Milwaukee Zoo, they had the, uh, the you know, small animal scientists from Madison working with the health officials, with the parasitologists, with the zoological people trying to piece this all together. So those interdisciplinary teams are very important. And lastly, I, I would sum up by saying by understanding the dynamics of these complicated ecosystems and vector situations can really help you understand why certain outbreaks and diseases are emerging and hopefully also lead to better control things. Um, that's my last slide. 
I've learned over the, I've worked with the University of Philippines in Manila for over 25 years. I've learned an awful lot about vector-borne diseases. This is one of the places that they always take me. And even though I'm linguistically challenged, I'm still working on my English, I've managed to say marang salamat po. Thank you very much. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah. So I'm not sure exactly how much time we have for that. I don't Suzanne? know if you know the answer to this, but but how long after infection is it felt to be a risk for young women having babies? How long after infection is it felt to be a risk? Um, I'm not sure exactly how to answer, but I think I think. <laughs> just just like with CMV or Toxo or other things, I mean, certainly the earlier in, in the trimesters it would be obviously more dangerous. Mm -hmm. I was actually surprised by this one patient who came, you know, my wife was five or six months pregnant and they went there and had a good time. And we don't know for, sure that for, for a fact that that's a case of microcephaly due to Zika, but it's sort of suspicious. Um, we also know that, just like that we discovered with the Ebola virus, uh, there's Zika viruses retain in an infected person's body for much longer than they used to think. <clears throat> so now the CDC is recommending, actually, you can send a urine for Zika DNA, uh, I think up to a month almost, after the you know, initial time of infection. So that's where things get really complicated, so and that's why there are uh, well-documented examples of sexual transmission of Zika in the United States. You know, say a, a male comes back infected with Zika, they have uh, unprotected sex uh, within a month or so, they still have Zika virus in them even though they're asymmetric or uh, asymptomatic. Uh, they transmit that to a, to a, a woman pregnant or getting pregnant and you have a local homegrown cause of Zika disease, but I'm not sure if that really answers what you Well, my next question is that since there's not IgG testing and there's only IgM testing, does it make sense that that young males and females coming back from parts of the world that have known Zika get an IgM test just as a screening test if they're planning on having a family? Yeah, I think sense? that's a great question. Um, I think it makes sense. Um, and I actually, have been, um, for another reason, I've been talking about this a little bit with, uh, for a different patient uh, who, is, who uh, is asking these same questions um, with the, uh, uh, what's the office? Um, it's one of the uh, in vitro fertilization groups here, it's the centers, and, and they're having to come up with these policies when they're having sperm donors and egg donors, you know, they're making up their own new rules about Zika. You know, how long are we going to quarantine somebody or make them not eligible to donate a sample? And it's still a little bit of work in progress, but if, if people are thinking at least a month, at least that's what the, uh, the one uh, in vitro uh, fertilization group said to me when I talked with them uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yes. It, I, I just had a, a patient <coughs> recently, so I had the opportunity to look it up at the CDC website, if I may share what I found out. Sure. And the, their recommendation is basically, uh, if you think you've had an exposure, just don't get pregnant, or they'll get anyone pregnant. Four weeks for women, six weeks for men. But no testing unless you are pregnant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the testing, even with the IgM, is a little bit dicey. They're not, you know, not everybody stays viremic as long as the next person. So, you know, if you tested negative with a DNA test after two weeks, is that you know, representative of the real? You know, it, it's a little bit. So they're being cautious. Do we have any idea how long a person may stay immune once they've contracted Zika? Yeah, there's no data that I'm aware of about immunity. Now, it's interesting you bring that up. Amongst the flaviviruses, it's always been sort of a, a controversial topic. So, you know, one of the other flaviviruses that's been around the world for a long time, people have been trying for 100 years on what, what working on vaccines against dengue. So, dengue is a classic flaviviruses disease that 
um, interesting immunology. So there, some people get, especially children, get horribly ill, die with hemorrhagic dengue. And one of the theories is that it's not so much the first time they get dengue, because there are several different serotypes, but it's the second or third time you get a different <coughs> serotype of dengue that uh, makes you have hemorrhagic disease. So there are, so the, the issue of, of having one flavivirus, dengue today, and Zika tomorrow, is, is do those kind of people have a worse prognosis than if you never had the dengue, or the first flaviviruses. So these combinations of flaviviruses, as we get better at sorting out the immunology, it's going to be interesting. But we just had a horribly, horribly ill um, gentleman in the hospital who just came uh, into the United States the day before from someplace in the Caribbean. He tested positive for, we, we still don't know what made him so deathly ill, but fortunately he survived. Um, he had positive serology for four different Coxsackie viruses, all IgG, he was dengue positive, he was, uh, he was positive for like five different viruses. He did not get tested for, uh, for Zika, actually, at that time. But, you know, knowing the weird immunological stories about multiple viruses or exposures, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's definitely a work in progress. You know, there's some, I know I used to work in Ecuador where there's always been dengue problems for years and years. And when, when the U.S. came down there to try to do some clinical trials for experimental dengue vaccine, nobody would, uh, would volunteer for the study. Because they said, well, if we volunteer for your study, we'll get an antibody response to dengue. And if next week we get dengue again, we'll die maybe. It's the same rationale that, you know, when I, when I worked down there, we, there was one year where they had this horrible 10 very young arm, Ecuadorian army recruits who were sent out to the Amazon to do jungle training in yellow fever endemic areas, but they wouldn't immunize them for yellow fever for the exact same reason. They were afraid, and dengue was much more common, so if they give them yellow fever, which is a vaccine, which is a flavivirus, and then they get dengue the next year, they might get sick and die from the dengue. So they wouldn't give them the yellow fever vaccine, and then you'd have them <coughs> dying of yellow fever and be gone from the jungle. So it's uh, these, these multiple flaviviruses. It's, it's a fascinating and very complicated immunological story. But uh, I think, uh, yeah, these rules about what should you know, might change a little bit as, as people get better at uh, developing specific tests. Yes? One more question oh. so we can go home with a brag to be. <laughs> Could you anymore? talk about voluntary termination of pregnancy? With, uh, yeah, I, I don't like to get into that myself, uh, but it is, uh, I think it's, it's going to be important to understand the real risk, you know, because not every, I think the data says that not every pregnant woman is going to have a microcephalic child. You know, what is it about the, you know, the ones that do have birth defects? Again, 80% of the people who get Zika, at least 50% of them maybe are women, um, are totally asymptomatic. Now, I think we don't quite know yet about um, the actual hard numbers and data to give that advice, but there's certain, you know, I, it's, it's, it's going to be a, a, a difficult question to, to ask. I don't know if we have the answer quite yet. Well, thank you very, very much.